I had always been a skeptic when it came to the paranormal. Ghosts, spirits, all that nonsense was just a way for people to explain the unexplainable. At least, that's what I thought. But my perspective changed the day I found that Craigslist job listing. It was a chilly autumn afternoon, and I was scrolling through Craigslist, desperate for any work I could get. Bills were piling up, and I needed something fast. That's when I came across a listing that caught my eye. Odd job needed. Must be willing to work nights, $100 hour. Location, Old Hollow Manor. Contact, Mrs. Grayson. The money was tempting. Sure, it sounded sketchy, but with desperation clouding my judgment, I shot off an email. Almost immediately, I received a response. Dear your name, thank you for your interest. Please meet me tonight at 7 p.m. The manor has a mind of its own, so please be on time. Mrs. Grayson. As the sun dipped below the horizon, I drove to Old Hollow Manor, a decrepit old place that looked like it had been abandoned for decades. The twisted trees surrounding it cast eerie shadows, and the wind howled like a pack of wolves. I pulled into the gravel driveway, gravel crunching beneath my tires, and parked in front of the creaking front door. I knocked, and after what felt like an eternity, the door swung open. Mrs. Grayson was an elderly woman's, her frail frame wrapped in a tattered shawl. Her eyes were sharp, glimmering like two cold stars in the dim light. Come in, she said, her voice like dry leaves rustling in the wind. We have much to do. As I stepped inside, a chill ran down my spine. The interior was even more unsettling than the outside. Shadows clung to the walls, and the air smelled musty like a forgotten tomb. Mrs. Grayson led me to a dusty parlor filled with antique furniture. An old chandelier hung above us, its crystals flickering in the faint light. I need help organizing the estate, she explained. There are things that must be dealt with. She hesitated as if weighing her words. This house has a history. What kind of history? I asked, half sarcastic. Tragedy, she whispered, her gaze distant. This house has seen many lives, many deaths. You may hear voices or see shadows. I chuckled nervously, trying to shake off the unease creeping in. Okay, so what do you want me to do? Start in the attic. There's an old trunk up there that needs to be brought down. The attic? Great. Just where I wanted to go. Still, the paycheck was too good to refuse. I grabbed a flashlight from the parlor and made my way upstairs. The wooden stairs creaked under my weight and I could hear the wind howling outside as if warning me to turn back. The attic door was heavy and it groaned in protest as I pushed it open. Dust swirled around me, illuminated by the beam of my flashlight. Cobwebs hung from the rafters like ghostly curtains. I stepped inside, scanning the room until my eyes landed on the trunk in the corner. It was old and ornate, covered in dust and rust. As I approached it, a chill washed over me, making the hairs on my neck stand up. I hesitated but finally knelt down and opened the trunk. Inside were old photographs, yellowed letters, and trinkets from a time long gone. As I sifted through the contents, I noticed something strange. The air grew colder and I could hear faint whispers, almost like a conversation echoing through the room. I looked around, convinced I was losing my mind. Then, I heard it. A soft, sorrowful wail. My heart raced. I grabbed the flashlight, shining it toward the shadows, but there was nothing there. The whispers intensified, swirling around me, their tones rising and falling like a haunting melody. I slammed the trunk shut, panic surging through me. I needed to get back downstairs. As I turned to leave, the temperature dropped even further. My breath came out in visible puffs, and the whispers turned into frantic cries. Help us! Help us! I stumbled back, my heart pounding like a drum in my chest. I bolted for the door, but it slammed shut, trapping me inside. The cries grew louder, echoing in my ears. Shadows danced along the walls, forming twisted shapes that seemed to reach out for me. I slammed my shoulder against the door, trying to force it open. Let me out, I shouted, panic taking hold. Just then, Mrs. Grayson appeared, her face pale and drawn. You shouldn't be here, she screamed, her voice filled with terror. They don't want you here. Who? I gasped, my breath hitching in my throat. The spirits. They're restless. You have to leave, now. As if on cue, the shadows surged forward, thus enveloping me in a suffocating darkness. I felt a cold hand brush against my arm, and a wave of despair washed over me. Please, I screamed, desperation clawing at my throat. I just wanted a job. Mrs. Grayson yanked the door open, and I bolted past her, stumbling down the stairs. I could hear the wailing behind me, echoing through the halls, begging for release. The front door loomed ahead, and I burst through it, the cool night air hitting me like a wave. I didn't stop running until I reached my car, fumbling with the keys as I struggled to catch my breath. I glanced back at the manor, the shadows swirling in the windows like dark clouds. 
and I knew I'd never return. I sped away, heart racing, the whispers still echoing in my mind. I thought I could forget, but the memory haunted me, the faces in the photographs lingering in my dreams. I had taken a job that night, but it came at a price, a price I could never pay. As the days turned into weeks, I found myself drawn back to that cursed place. The job listing had vanished, but I couldn't shake the feeling that the spirits were still reaching out, desperate for someone to listen, to remember. Maybe it was my fault. Maybe I had disturbed something that should have remained undisturbed. But I was just a desperate soul looking for work, right? Or maybe, just maybe, I had opened a door that could never be closed. Story number two. I never thought I'd be one of those people who got caught up in a Craigslist job, but the economy had taken a turn, and I was desperate. When I stumbled across a listing for a general laborer at a place called Hawthorne Mill, it felt like fate. The pay was decent, and the job seemed simple enough. Help clean up the old mill and prepare it for renovation. I figured it would be a good way to earn some cash while keeping my schedule flexible. When I arrived, the sun was setting, casting eerie shadows on the dilapidated building. The mill loomed before me, a structure of peeling paint and broken windows. I couldn't shake the feeling that something was off as I parked my car. A chill crept up my spine, but I brushed it aside. After all, it was just an old building, right? The moment I stepped inside, the air felt different. It was heavy, like the mill itself was breathing. I spotted a man standing in the corner, his back turned to me, hunched over a stack of old newspapers. He was wearing a faded green jumpsuit, covered in stains. You must be here for the job, he said without turning around. His voice was low, almost a whisper. I introduced myself and mentioned the Craigslist ad. He finally turned to face me, revealing a gaunt face with sunken eyes and a faint, unsettling smile. Welcome to Hawthorne Mill. I'm Frank. We've got a lot of work to do, he said, gesturing toward a pile of debris in the center of the room. Just be careful. Things can get strange around here. Strange? I shrugged it off as an attempt to be funny. I picked up a broom and started sweeping away the dust, trying to ignore the odd creaking noises echoing through the building. It felt as though the mill itself was alive, groaning and whispering secrets. As I worked, I started to notice little things. Flickering lights, shadows darting just out of my line of sight, and a persistent cold breeze that seemed to swirl around me even though the windows were boarded up. Frank was quiet, only occasionally stopping to watch me with those hollow eyes, and I began to feel increasingly uneasy. Around midnight, we took a break, sitting on a couple of overturned crates. I tried to make small talk. So, how long has this place been closed? I asked. Frank's gaze drifted towards the far wall, where the shadows seemed to gather thicker. Oh, it's been years. People say it's haunted, he said, his voice barely above a whisper. You should have heard the stories about the old mill. They say a worker died here. Something about a terrible accident. I laughed nervously, trying to lighten the mood. Just an urban legend, right? But Frank didn't laugh. He just stared at me, his expression grave. Be careful, or you might find out for yourself. That was when the lights flickered again, plunging us into darkness for a brief moment. My heart raced, and I felt a chill crawl down my spine. When the lights came back on, Frank was gone. I called out his name, but my voice echoed back, lonely and empty. Panic began to creep in. I grabbed my phone, hoping to call someone, but there was no service. I was utterly alone in this old mill, with only the haunting sounds of the building to keep me company. The wind whistled through the cracks, and I could swear I heard faint whispers, like voices in the shadows. Suddenly, I felt a cold breath on my neck. I whipped around, but no one was there. I stumbled back, my heart pounding. Just then, I heard a loud crash from the other room, a sound so terrifying it sent me racing down the hallway. I had to get out of there. As I sprinted, the shadows seemed to twist and stretch, forming shapes that lurked just out of reach. I reached the entrance, but the door wouldn't budge. Panic set in as I pulled on the handle, my heart pounding in my chest. The whispers grew louder, echoing around me, taunting me. Help! I screamed, desperation flooding my voice. Is anyone there? No response, just the echoes of my own fear. Finally, after what felt like an eternity, I managed to push the door open, tumbling out into the night air. I didn't stop running until I reached my car, fumbling with the keys in my trembling hands. I jumped in, slamming the door shut behind me. As I started the engine, I glanced back at the mill. The windows seemed to stare at me, dark and empty, but I swore I saw a figure standing in the doorway, watching. I sped away, my heart racing, but the sense of dread lingered. I thought I was free, 
But as I drove home, the whispers followed me, invading my thoughts. I couldn't shake the feeling that something was watching me, lurking in the shadows. When I finally reached my apartment, I locked the door behind me, shaking. I collapsed onto my couch, breathing heavily, trying to convince myself it was all just my imagination. But sleep eluded me. Every creak of the building made me jump. Every shadow felt alive. Days passed, but the memory of that night haunted me. I began to research Hawthorne Mill, only to discover a dark history. Rumors of workers disappearing, strange accidents, and sightings of ghosts. I couldn't shake the feeling that I had angered something that night, and it was waiting for me. One evening, as I sat on my couch, I heard a knock at the door. My heart raced. I wasn't expecting anyone. Hesitantly, I approached and peered through the peephole. No one was there. I opened the door slightly, scanning the hallway. Nothing but the dim glow of the lights. I shrugged it off, closing the door behind me. That night, I heard the whispers again. This time, they were clearer. Help us. Help us. I couldn't take it anymore. I grabbed my phone, my fingers shaking as I dialed Frank's number. To my surprise, it rang. I held my breath as I listened to the ringing, hoping he'd pick up. After a few rings, I heard a raspy voice on the other end. Hello? Frank? It's me. I need to know what happened at the mill. There was a long pause before he spoke. You shouldn't have gone back there. They won't let you leave now. You have to come back. The line went dead. Panic surged through me as I felt the shadows close in. My heart raced as I turned to the window, and there it was. A figure standing in the darkness, watching. It was then I understood. I had unleashed something, and now it was coming for me. With a final breath, I realized I had become part of Hawthorne Mill's tragic tale. Trapped in a nightmare with no escape. Story the end. Story number three. I never thought a simple gig from Craigslist would lead me to this moment. After losing my job in retail, I found myself scrolling through job listings, hoping for a miracle. That's when I stumbled upon a post titled, Last Minute Delivery Driver Needed High Pay. The ad was vague, promising an unusually high rate for what seemed like a simple delivery task. Desperate for cash, I clicked on it without hesitation. Uh, the contact was a man named Mark, who asked me to meet him at a nondescript warehouse on the outskirts of town. As I drove there, a sense of unease settled in my stomach, but the thought of my empty bank account pushed my worries aside. When I arrived, the sun was beginning to set, casting long shadows that danced along the ground. The warehouse was old and decrepit, its paint peeling and windows cracked. I parked my car and approached the entrance, where Mark awaited me. He was a tall man with sharp features and an unsettling smile. Glad you could make it, he said, his voice too enthusiastic. Let's get you set up. Inside, the warehouse was dimly lit, the flickering fluorescent lights casting a harsh glow on stacks of boxes. Mark led me to a small office in the back where he explained the task. I just need you to deliver this package to a client. It's urgent, he said, handing me a small, unmarked box. Pay is upon delivery. You'll make a good amount. I nodded, feeling the weight of the box in my hands. It was surprisingly heavy for its size, but I shrugged it off. Where's the delivery location? Mark glanced around, his eyes darting nervously. Just follow the directions I wrote down. And remember, don't open the box. Just deliver it and come straight back. Something about his demeanor made me uneasy, but I forced a smile and agreed. I took the slip of paper with the address and left the warehouse, shaking off the strange feeling that lingered. As I drove toward the destination, the sky turned dark, clouds rolling in like a heavy blanket. I followed the directions, winding through empty streets and past old abandoned houses. The atmosphere grew increasingly eerie as if I had stepped into a different world. Finally, I arrived at an old Victorian house at the end of a long driveway. The windows were dark and the yard was overgrown with weeds. A chill ran down my spine as I parked the car and approached the door. I knocked, my heart racing, but no one answered. I glanced at the box in my hands, hesitating for a moment. Should I leave it on the porch? Just as I turned to leave, the door creaked open. An elderly woman stood there, her hair wild and unkempt. Her eyes widened as she saw me, and I felt a rush of discomfort at the sight of her. You have it, she said breathlessly, her voice trembling. You've brought it. Um, yeah, I stammered, holding out the box. Mark sent me. She stepped closer, her hands shaking as she took the package from me. Thank you, dear. You must leave now. It's not safe here. Wait, what do you mean? I asked, confusion creeping in. What's in the box? The woman's eyes darkened and she glanced over her shoulder as if expecting someone. You mustn't open it. It's a trap. Before I could respond, she slammed the door shut, 
leaving me standing on the porch, feeling more lost than ever. I backed away slowly, glancing around the yard. The air felt heavy, and an unsettling feeling gnawed at me. I knew I had to leave, but the woman's warning echoed in my mind. Suddenly, a loud bang came from inside the house, followed by a series of frantic voices. I could hear the woman yelling, pleading for someone to leave her alone. My heart raced as I turned to my car, but just then the front door burst open and two shadowy figures emerged, pushing the woman aside. They were tall and menacing, their faces obscured by shadows. Where is it? One of them growled, scanning the area. My instincts kicked in, and I sprinted back to my car, fumbling with the keys as panic surged through me. I could hear their footsteps behind me, quick and heavy, the sound sending a chill down my spine. As I jumped into the driver's seat and slammed the door shut, I glanced in the rearview mirror. The figures were just a few feet away, their eyes glowing with anger. I started the engine, adrenaline fueling my movements as I backed out of the driveway and sped away from the house. My heart raced as I drove, trying to shake the terror of what had just happened. I needed to get back to the warehouse to confront Mark. What had I gotten myself into? I felt sick to my stomach as I recalled the woman's words, It's a trap. When I returned to the warehouse, it was dark and silent, the lights flickering ominously. I parked my car and rushed inside, the sound of my footsteps echoing against the cold concrete floor. I found Mark sitting at his desk, a smug look on his face. Did you deliver it? He asked, feigning casualness. How did it go? Mark, what the hell is going on? That woman, she said it was a trap, I gasped, breathless. He leaned back in his chair, a sinister smile creeping across his face. Oh, it is. But you see, it's not just a job. It's a test. You delivered it to the right person. They're the ones who need it, and they'll come for you now. My stomach dropped as realization hit. You set me up. Mark's smile widened. You'll never be able to escape them. You've become part of something much bigger. Just then, the lights flickered again, plunging the warehouse into darkness. I heard the unmistakable sound of footsteps approaching, echoing from the shadows. Panic surged through me as I backed away, feeling the cold walls pressing in. Mark, help! I yelled, but he just sat there, grinning as the darkness enveloped me. I could hear the whispers again, growing louder, echoing with a chilling urgency. You shouldn't have come here. I turned to flee, but the figures emerged from the shadows, their faces now illuminated by a flickering light. The same shadowy figures from the house stood before me, and I realized too late that I had walked right into their trap. In that moment, I understood. There was no escape from the web Mark had woven. I had been lured into a sinister game, and now I was just another piece to be claimed. As their cold hands grasped me, dragging me into the darkness, I screamed, but it was swallowed by the void. The last thing I saw was Mark's twisted smile as I was pulled away, my fate sealed in a nightmare that began with a simple Craigslist job. Story the end. Story number four. I was stuck in a dead-end job at a local diner when I came across a Craigslist ad that promised big money for a part-time night shift. The listing was, was vague but enticing. Help wanted. Night security guard. $25 an hour. Immediate start. I had bills to pay and the thought of making extra cash while doing something easy was too tempting to pass up. I clicked on the link and found the contact information for a man named Victor. He was curt but friendly when we spoke on the phone. You can start tonight, he said. Just come to the old warehouse by the docks. I'll fill you in on the details when you arrive. As night fell, I drove through the empty streets toward the docks. The air was thick with fog, and the moonlight barely penetrated the mist. I parked in front of a large, dilapidated warehouse that loomed ominously in the darkness. It was an intimidating sight, but the thought of the paycheck pushed my nerves aside. Victor was already waiting for me inside, a bulky man with a scruffy beard and a worn-out baseball cap. Glad you made it, he said, his voice gravelly. This place can be creepy at night, but all you have to do is watch the security monitors and make sure no one breaks in. Uh, I followed him to a small office in the back where several security monitors blinked to life. The dim light illuminated stacks of crates and shadows lurking in the corners. I'll be in and out, Victor said, handing me a flashlight. Call me if you need anything. I'll pay you at the end of your shift. After he left, I settled into the squeaky chair the monitors displaying various angles of the warehouse. It was eerily quiet. At first, I felt anxious, but as the minutes turned into hours, I began to relax. The repetitive clicking of the camera feeds became a lullaby, and I almost dozed off. Suddenly, one of the screens flickered, and I jolter appeared on the monitor. 
Stiger standing in the far corner of the warehouse. My heart raced as I leaned closer to the screen, trying to make sense of what I was seeing. The figure was obscured by shadows, its outline shifting and undulating like smoke. I rubbed my eyes, thinking it was a trick of the light. But when I looked again, the figure was still there. Panic gripped me as I grabbed the flashlight and stood up, shining the beam into the darkness of the warehouse. Hello? I called out, my voice echoing eerily in the vast emptiness. No response. I returned to the monitors, and the figure was gone. I convinced myself it was just my imagination playing tricks on me. Uh, I took a deep breath and settled back into my chair, trying to shake the feeling of unease. Minutes passed, but the uneasy feeling didn't fade. I forced myself to focus on the screens, my eyes scanning for any sign of movement. Then, just as I was beginning to relax again, the same shadowy figure flickered back into view on the monitor. This time, it seemed closer, standing against a stack of crates. My heart pounded in my chest. I grabbed the flashlight and marched toward the area where I had seen the figure. The beam of light cut through the darkness, illuminating cobwebs and dust motes dancing in the air, but there was no one there. Is anyone here? I shouted, my voice trembling. Silence. Just as I turned to head back to the office, I heard a faint whisper. It was a soft, mournful sound that seemed to call my name. Help me. Help me. I froze, goosebumps prickling my skin. The voice echoed in my mind, and I felt an overwhelming urge to find its source. Against my better judgment, I followed the sound deeper into the warehouse, flashlight in hand. Hello? I called, but the whispering grew louder, more insistent. Help me? I stumbled upon an old, rusted door tucked away behind a stack of crates. The whispers seemed to come from within. I hesitated, fear gripping my heart, but I pushed the door open. It creaked loudly, revealing a dark room filled with broken machinery and shadows. As I stepped inside, the whispers intensified, swirling around me. Help me. It was all around me now, echoing in my ears. My heart raced as I took a few tentative steps forward. That's when I noticed a figure hunched in the corner, shrouded in darkness. I aimed my flashlight toward it, revealing a gaunt man with hollow eyes staring back at me, his mouth moving but no words came out. I gasped and stumbled back. What are you doing here? I shouted. Help me. He whispered again, reaching out with bony fingers. I can't escape. Fear surged through me, and I turned to flee, but the door slammed shut behind me with a deafening bang. I pounded on it, my heart racing. Let me out, please. Help me. The figure's voice was chilling. He began to rise, moving toward me with an unnatural grace. His face twisted in agony. I could see the desperation in his eyes. In a panic, I turned back to the flashlight, trying to shine it on him, but the light flickered and died. I was plunged into darkness, the only sound, the echo of his soft, agonizing whispers. I could feel his cold breath against my skin, and I screamed, pounding on the door. Suddenly, the door swung open, and I stumbled out into the hallway. I didn't look back as I ran toward the office, my breath coming in ragged gasps. I slammed the door behind me and locked it, trembling. The monitors were still flickering, but the shadowy figure was gone. I felt like I was losing my mind. I fumbled for my phone to call Victor, but I realized I had left it in the car. I cursed under my breath, looking around for anything that might help me. I couldn't shake the feeling that something was terribly wrong. Minutes turned into hours, and I waited in the office, listening intently for any sign of Victor. But the warehouse remained eerily quiet. I couldn't escape the sensation of being watched. I glanced at the monitors again, but nothing moved. I tried to convince myself it was all in my head. Just when I thought I might be able to relax, I heard a faint knock at the door. My heart raced. Victor? I called out, my voice trembling. The knocking continued, growing louder and more urgent. Help me. It was the same voice from before. The fear clawed at my insides and I felt paralyzed. The door rattled as something slammed against it from the other side. Let me in. I screamed, but the voice only grew more frantic. I pressed my back against the wall, enough breathing heavily as the room seemed to close in on me. I was trapped. Then, as suddenly as it began, the knocking stopped. Silence enveloped the room. I held my breath, straining to hear anything, but there was nothing, only the oppressive stillness. After what felt like an eternity, I finally found the courage to move. I tiptoed to the door, listening carefully. Victor? I called softly, hoping for a response. No answer. I slowly turned the knob and cracked the door open, my peeking out into the dark hallway. The silence was deafening. My heart pounded as I stepped out into the corridor, scanning the area for any signs of movement. The warehouse was empty, the monitors still displaying nothing but static. 
But then I caught sight of something on the ground, an old torn piece of fabric. I picked it up, realizing it was part of a uniform, just like the one I was wearing. Panic surged through me. What the hell is going on? I muttered under my breath. The whispers returned, swirling around me. Help me. They echoed louder, filling my mind. I had to get out. I ran back to the front entrance, praying the door would be unlocked. When I reached it, I flung the door open and sprinted outside into the cool night air. I didn't stop running until I reached my car, fumbling with the keys in my hands. I was almost there when I felt a cold grip on my shoulder. I spun around to see Victor standing behind me, his eyes wide with an expression I couldn't quite decipher. What are you doing? You can't leave, he shouted, his voice filled with urgency. Why? What's going on in there? I gasped, panic coursing through my veins. They'll come for you if you don't finish your shift, he warned, his grip tightening. You have to stay. Stay? Are you insane? I yelled, wrenching free from his grasp. I saw something in there. I'm done. Please, listen to me, Victor pleaded, desperation creeping into his voice. You don't understand what you're dealing with. You have to. Suddenly, the shadows in the warehouse seemed to shift, and I could hear the whispers rising to a crescendo. Help me, they echoed through the night, wrapping around us like a thick fog. I'm not going back in there, I screamed, climbing into my car and slamming the door. I fumbled with the keys, my hands shaking. I looked back to see Victor standing at the entrance, his expression a mix of fear and helplessness. As I started the engine, the whispers grew louder, a cacophony of sorrow and... Story number five. I had just graduated and was moving to the city for my first job. I was excited but broke, so I needed a roommate to share expenses. After days of searching, I found a Craigslist ad that seemed perfect. It read, Room for rent in historic brownstone. $500 a month. Contact Sarah. I shot off a quick email, not expecting much. Within hours, I received a response. Hi, I'm Sarah. The room is still available. Can you come by tomorrow evening at 6 p.m.? Looking forward to meeting you. The following evening, I arrived at the Brownstone, a charming building with worn brick and ivy climbing the sides. The front door creaked as I entered, revealing a warm, inviting interior filled with vintage furniture and eclectic decor. Sarah, a tall woman in her late 20s with curly hair and a welcoming smile, greeted me. Welcome. I'm so glad you could make it, she said, leading me into the living room. I hope you don't mind the decor. I've been collecting antiques for years. As we chatted, I couldn't help but feel at ease. The place had a cozy atmosphere, filled with the scent of fresh coffee and the soft sound of classical music playing in the background. So, what do you think? Sarah asked, her eyes sparkling. The room is upstairs, and the rent includes utilities. I'm pretty laid back, so we can keep things chill. I couldn't see any red flags. The room was small but quaint, with a big window overlooking a quiet street. I agreed on the spot, thrilled to find a place so quickly. Over the next few weeks, life in the brownstone was fantastic. Sarah was an excellent roommate. She was kind and often brought home treats from her job at a local bakery. However, as the days went by, I began to notice something odd. Every night at exactly 3 a.m., I would hear faint whispers coming from Sarah's room. It sounded like a conversation, but I could never quite make out the words. I brushed it off, convincing myself it was just my imagination. One night, curiosity got the better of me. I lay in bed, listening closely, and the whispers grew louder, more distinct. I could hear a woman's voice and what sounded like a man responding. What are they talking about? I wondered. After a few more nights of restless sleep, I decided to confront Sarah. Hey, I keep hearing voices at night. Are you on the phone or something? She laughed, brushing it off. Oh no, I'm a heavy sleeper. I doubt it's me. Maybe it's just the old pipes. This building has a history, you know. Yeah, I heard it's historic, I said, but I couldn't shake the unease creeping into my mind. Things continued as usual until one evening, Sarah came home looking pale and shaken. I had the strangest experience today, she said, her voice shaky. I swear I saw someone standing in the hallway. I raised an eyebrow. What do you mean? Like a ghost? I don't know. I just... It was a figure, and when I turned, it was gone, she explained, her hands trembling slightly. It felt so real. Maybe you were just tired, I suggested, but even as I said it, I felt a chill run down my spine. The following night, the whispers were more pronounced than ever, echoing through the hall. I lay in bed, trying to ignore them, but I couldn't. Finally, I decided to investigate. I crept out of my room and made my way down the dimly lit hallway towards Sarah's door. As I approached, I could hear the voices clearer. 
a heated argument between the man and the woman. My heart raced, but I pressed my ear against the door, straining to catch every word. Why can't you just let it go? The woman pleaded. You don't understand. I can't move on, the man replied, his voice thick with emotion. You promised we'd be together forever, I recoiled in shock. The conversation sounded intensely personal, almost like it was unfolding right in front of me. I knocked softly, the sound echoing in the silence. Sarah? I called out, trying to keep my voice steady. The voices fell silent, and I waited anxiously. Yeah? Sarah replied, sounding startled. Is everything okay? I asked, my voice trembling. Just, just a little tired, she said, but her tone was off. I returned to my room, uneasy, and lay awake for hours, replaying the conversation in my mind. I knew I had to confront Sarah again, but a part of me feared what I might uncover. A few days later, I found myself alone in the apartment while Sarah was out. The silence felt heavy, and as the clock struck 3 a.m., the whispers returned, louder and more urgent. I couldn't resist any longer. I stepped out into the hallway, feeling a pull towards Sarah's door. As I approached, I noticed it was slightly ajar. I hesitated, but pushed it open slowly. The room was dark, the only light coming from a small lamp on the bedside table. I scanned the space and saw something that made my blood run cold. The room was filled with shadows, darker than the rest of the darkness around me. They twisted and danced, coalescing into two figures. A man and a woman, their faces obscured, but their body language animated and frantic. I stumbled back, heart racing, but they didn't notice me. Instead, they seemed to be arguing passionately, their voices rising and falling like a storm. I strained to hear. Why can't you accept what happened? The woman cried. You can't stay here forever. I won't leave you. The man shouted, desperation lacing his tone. Suddenly they turned and I felt a rush of icy air wash over me. The figures locked eyes with me, their expressions filled with anguish. My instincts screamed at me to flee, but I was frozen in place. Who are you? I managed to whisper, but no sound came out. The man took a step forward, extending his hand, a plea in his eyes. Help us, please. The room felt like it was closing in on me. The shadows crept closer, whispering incoherently, wrapping around me like a shroud. My heart raced, and I finally snapped back to reality. I turned and ran, stumbling down the hallway and back into my room, slamming the door shut. I locked it and collapsed onto my bed, gasping for breath. I knew I had to get out of there. This place was haunted, and Sarah was somehow involved. The next morning, I confronted Sarah over breakfast, trying to sound calm. I heard voices in your room last night. What's going on? She froze, her fork halfway to her mouth. What do you mean? The whispers. The shadows. There were, there were people, I stammered, my voice trembling. Her expression shifted from surprise to something unreadable. You shouldn't have gone in there, she said slowly. You don't know what you're getting into. Then tell me, who are those people? What's going on? I demanded. I, I can't explain it all now, she replied, her voice barely above a whisper. But they're tied to this house. It's complicated. I was done with complications. I can't stay here anymore, Sarah. I'm leaving. Her expression changed, becoming desperate. You don't understand. They need our help. Help? They're haunting us. I shot back, feeling the adrenaline surge. I'm out of here. As I grabbed my things and rushed toward the door, Sarah, Sarah stepped in front of me. You can't leave. If you do, they'll come for you. I pushed past her, fear clawing at my insides. You're crazy. This whole situation is insane. I burst out of the apartment and down the stairs, the shadows feeling like they were following me. The moment I stepped outside, I felt a wave of relief wash over me, but I could still hear the whispers in my ears. Just as I reached my car, I glanced back at the building. The windows were dark, but I could have sworn I saw two figures staring at me. Panic set in, and I jumped into my car, slamming the door shut. I sped away, heart racing, the whispers fading into the distance. I never returned to that brownstone. A week later, I found a new place, and every time I heard a faint whisper or felt a chill in the air, I would remember the haunted apartment and the figures that begged for help. The whispers continued to haunt my dreams, a constant reminder uh, of the darkness that lingered in that old building. I learned that sometimes it's best to ignore the allure of a good deal, especially when it comes from Craigslist. Story number six. I had just moved to a new city for a job opportunity that seemed too good to be true. I was excited but still broke from the move, so I decided to look for some side work. While scrolling through Craigslist, I stumbled upon an ad that read, Housekeeper needed for historic home. Flexible hours, good pay. Contact Mr. Harper. 
I was intrigued. It was a chance to earn some extra cash and the pay was better than I expected. I shot off an email expressing my interest. To my surprise, I received a response almost immediately. Hello, thank you for your inquiry. Can you come by tomorrow at 4 p.m. for an interview? Best, Mr. Harper. The next day, I arrived at the address, a sprawling old Victorian house at the end of a quiet street. The paint was peeling and the yard was overgrown, but there was an undeniable charm to it. I knocked and the door swung open to reveal Mr. Harper, a middle-aged man with a kind smile and disheveled hair. Welcome. I'm so glad you came. Please come in, he said, ushering me inside. The interior was just as old as the exterior, filled with antique furniture and faded photographs lining the walls. As we talked, I learned that Mr. Harper was a writer who had inherited the house from his late parents. He needed help maintaining the place and keeping it tidy while he worked on his novel. He seemed genuine, and the job sounded simple enough. I accepted on the spot. The next day, I started working. I spent hours cleaning and dusting, the creaks of the old house echoing around me. It felt like I was in a time capsule. The air was thick with the scent of aged wood and something else I couldn't quite place. As I worked, I began to notice odd things. Sometimes I'd hear soft whispers like someone was speaking just out of earshot. Other times, I'd catch glimpses of shadows darting past the corner of my eye, but I brushed it off as my imagination running wild in the old house. A week passed, and I was settling into the routine. One afternoon, while cleaning the upstairs bedroom, I found an old trunk hidden in the corner of the closet. It was dusty and locked, the metal tarnished. Curiosity got the better of me, and I decided to ask Mr. Harper about it when he returned home. When he arrived that evening, I brought it up. I found a trunk in the bedroom closet. Do you know anything about it? His expression changed, a flicker of unease crossing his face. Ah, yes. That trunk. It belonged to my mother. She always said it was filled with memories, but she never let anyone open it. Memories? What kind? I pressed, but he waved a hand dismissively. Just things from her past. Nothing of importance. I'd prefer you leave it alone, he said, his tone more serious. I nodded, sensing I had crossed the line, but my curiosity lingered. As the days went on, the whispers grew louder. They felt more urgent, as if they were trying to tell me something. I often heard them at night, echoing through the halls. I tried to dismiss them, but the unease settled deeper. Then one night, as I was cleaning the kitchen, I heard a soft knock at the back door. I froze, heart racing. Who could it be? I glanced at the clock. It was past 10 p.m. I hesitated, but decided to check. I opened the door a crack and peered outside. The yard was dimly lit by a few flickering street lamps, but no one was there. Just as I was about to close the door, I noticed a figure standing at the edge of the yard, half hidden in the shadows. Hello? I called out, but there was no response. The figure seemed to shift, and for a moment, I thought I saw a woman in a flowing white dress. Then she disappeared into the darkness. I shut the door, shaking. Was I seeing things? My mind raced, but I tried to convince myself it was just my imagination. The next evening, while cleaning the attic, I stumbled upon an old photo album. Dusting it off, I opened it, and my breath caught in my throat. The photographs were of a family smiling and happy, but one photo stood out. Oh, a woman in a white dress, standing in front of the house, her eyes filled with sorrow. I flipped the pages, and my heart sank. There were more pictures of the same woman, always in white, always looking forlorn. In some photos, she stood alone, while in others, she was with a man who looked eerily like Mr. Harper. I rushed downstairs, my mind racing. Mr. Harper, I called out as he entered from the study. What's wrong? He asked, concern etched on his face. I found an album in the attic. It's about a woman. Is she your mother? I asked, my voice trembling. He paled, and I could see the anger rising within him. You shouldn't have been in the attic. Mr. Harper, I think she needs help, I insisted, my heart racing. She's, she's in the photos, and I think she's been trying to reach out to me. He looked at me, his expression hardening. Leave it alone. She's not to be disturbed. Why not? I pressed, desperation creeping into my voice. What happened to her? But he turned away, refusing to answer. That night, I couldn't sleep, the whispers growing more frantic. I lay in bed, tossing and turning, trying to block them out. Just as I began to drift off, a loud crash echoed through the house, waking me with a start. I jumped out of bed and ran downstairs. The sound had come from the kitchen. I switched on the light, heart pounding, and saw that a cabinet door had swung open, dishes scattered across the floor. Hello? I called out, my voice echoing through the silence. 
Suddenly the temperature dropped and I felt a presence behind me. I turned slowly and saw her, a woman in a white dress, her face pale and eyes filled with sorrow. I froze, fear gripping me. Help me, she whispered, her voice like a breeze. I backed away, but she followed, her expression pleading. Help me, please. What do you want? I stammered, panic rising, trapped, need to be free. Her words were barely audible, filled with desperation. I didn't know what to do. Just then, I remembered the trunk. Is it in the trunk? I asked, my voice trembling. The woman nodded slowly, her eyes filled with tears. I felt a surge of courage. Okay, I'll help you. I rushed upstairs, my heart racing as I made my way to the bedroom. The trunk loomed in the corner, still locked. I rifled through drawers, desperate to find a key. As I searched, I heard footsteps behind me. Stop! Mr. Harper shouted, barreling into the room. What are you doing? I need to open the trunk! I cried, panic coursing through me. She needs my help! No, you can't! He lunged for me, but I dodged, heart pounding. Just then, the woman appeared again, her form flickering like a candle in the wind. She reached out toward the trunk. Help me. Mr. Harper froze, his face pale. You don't understand. You'll unleash something terrible. Terrible or not, she deserves peace. I shouted, finding a small key in the drawer. I inserted it into the trunk's lock, and with a click, it opened. The trunk creaked as I lifted the lid, revealing a collection of old letters, trinkets, and a small dusty locket. The moment I touched it, a rush of energy surged through the room. The air crackled, and the woman's figure flickered closer. Thank you, she whispered, her voice echoing in the silence. Mr. Harper stepped back, eyes wide with fear. No, close it. You don't know what you're doing. But it was too late. The energy swirled around me, and I felt a weight lifting. The woman's form began to solidify, her sorrowful eyes finally filling with light. I can go now. Thank you, she said, and with that, she vanished, leaving behind a warmth that filled the room. Mr. Harper stood frozen, his expression shifting from fear to something else. Regranger? You shouldn't have done that, he said, his voice low. What happened to her? I asked, breathing heavily. She was my mother, he admitted, his voice thick with emotion. She was trapped here, tied to the house, and I couldn't let her go. She was... she was never the same after my father died. Why didn't you want her to be free? I questioned, my heart aching for the woman I had only seen briefly. I thought she needed me to protect her. I didn't want her to suffer, he confessed, tears brimming in his eyes. The realization washed over me. You were afraid she'd leave you, I whispered, understanding the pain behind his anger. I just wanted her to be okay, he replied, his voice breaking. I looked at the open trunk, feeling a mix of sadness and relief. She is okay now, Mr. Harper. Story number seven. When I moved to a new town for a fresh start, I was eager to settle into my cozy little house. With a new job and bills piling up, I knew I'd need a little extra cash to make ends meet. So when I stumbled upon a Craigslist ad that read, Experienced carpenter needed for restorations. Pay negotiable. Contact John. I jumped at the opportunity. I was no master carpenter, but I had enough experience to get by. I quickly fired off an email, and to my surprise, I received a reply almost immediately. Hello, thank you for your interest. Can you come by the old Miller house tomorrow at 5 p.m.? Best, John. The Miller house was notorious in town. A beautiful but dilapidated old mansion, it stood at the end of a long, winding road, surrounded by a thick forest. Locals whispered about it being haunted, a place no one dared to enter after dark. I felt a thrill of excitement mixed with apprehension as I drove there the next evening. As I approached the house, I felt a shiver run down my spine. The mansion loomed ahead, its windows dark and foreboding. I parked and made my way to the entrance, my footsteps crunching on the gravel. I knocked, and a moment later, the door creaked open to reveal John, a tall, rugged man with a scruffy beard and tired eyes. Welcome. Come in, he said, his voice warm despite the eerie surroundings. The interior was dimly lit, filled with the smell of sawdust and wood polish. I'm glad you came. This place has seen better days, but with a little work, it can be beautiful again. As we walked through the house, I noticed the ornate woodwork and grand staircases, hidden beneath layers of dust and neglect. John explained that he was restoring the mansion to its former glory, but he needed extra hands to help with the massive task. I'm not a professional carpenter, I admitted, trying to temper his expectations. That's fine. I can teach you, he replied, his enthusiasm infectious. We shook hands, and I was officially hired. The next morning, I arrived bright and early, ready to tackle the first project, repairing the front porch. As we worked, John shared stories about the house's history and the Miller family who once lived there. 
But he also mentions strange occurrences, doors creaking open, whispers in the night, and objects moving inexplicably. It's just an old house settling, he laughed, but I could see the hint of unease in his eyes. As the days passed, I couldn't shake the feeling that I was being watched. Every time I turned around, I felt the prickling sensation on the back of my neck. I dismissed it as nerves, after all, the house was massive and full of shadows. One evening, as I was cleaning up tools in the living room, I heard a soft humming coming from the kitchen. It was gentle and melodic, like a lullaby. Curious, I followed the sound. The kitchen was dark, save for the fading light from the setting sun filtering through the window. I peered inside, but found nothing. The humming stopped suddenly, leaving an eerie silence. Must be my imagination, I muttered to myself. I decided to leave early that night, shaking off the lingering chill. The next day, we worked on the upstairs bedrooms. I noticed John was quieter than usual, distracted. Everything okay? I asked. Yeah, just tired, he replied, but I could see he was troubled. That evening, while cleaning up, I decided to explore a little. I headed up to the attic, curiosity pulling me toward the unknown. The attic was filled with old furniture, boxes, and cobwebs. As I rummaged through the junk, I found an old diary, its cover worn and the pages yellowed with age. Opening it, I discovered it belonged to a young girl named Clara Miller. The entries were sweet, detailing her life in the house, her love for her family, and her dreams of becoming a musician. But the last few entries took a darker turn, speaking of strange noises and feelings of dread. Something isn't right, Clara wrote. I hear whispers in the night and sometimes I feel like I'm not alone. I felt a chill creep up my spine as I read the final entry. I don't think I'll be here much longer. I'm scared. I closed the diary, shaken. What had happened to Clara? I hurried downstairs, ready to share my findings with John. John! I called out as I reached the living room, but the house was silent. I checked the clock. It was already past 7 p.m. He had left without telling me. Feeling uneasy, I decided to leave for the night. As I stepped outside, the sun dipped below the horizon, casting long shadows across the yard. I, I climbed into my car, the weight of the day's discoveries heavy on my mind. But as I prepared to leave, something caught my eye in the rearview mirror, a flicker of movement in the house. I turned to look, and my breath caught in my throat. There, in the upstairs window, stood a figure, a girl in a white dress, her hair cascading around her shoulders, staring down at me. I blinked, and she was gone. Panic surged through me as I drove away, the image of Clara etched in my mind. That night, I couldn't sleep, haunted by the whispers and the girl in the window. The next morning, I returned to the Miller house, determined to find John and confront him about what I had discovered. When I arrived, the house felt even more ominous. I knocked, but there was no answer. Hesitantly, I pushed the door open and called out, John, are you here? Silence. I stepped inside, feeling the weight of the air pressing down on me. I made my way through the house, light, searching for him. As I entered the kitchen, I froze. The table was set as if for a meal, but the chairs were overturned and the dishes lay shattered on the floor. John! I shouted, my heart racing. Still, there was no response. I turned to leave when I heard it, the soft humming again, this time coming from the attic. My instincts screamed at me to run, but curiosity got the better of me. I slowly ascended the stairs, the creaking wood beneath my feet echoing in the silence. As I reached the attic, I was met with a chilling sight. The girl in the white dress stood there, staring at me with hauntingly sad eyes. Help me, she whispered, her voice barely above a breath. What do you want? I stammered, panic rising in my chest. The music, she said, pointing to an old dusty piano in the corner of the attic. Play it. I don't know how to play, I said, fear gripping my heart. Please, she implored, stepping closer. It will free me. I hesitated, but I could see the desperation in her eyes. Gathering my courage, I approached the piano and sat down. My fingers hovered over the keys, trembling. I pressed one down softly, the sound reverberating in the quiet attic. Suddenly, the air around me shifted, the temperature dropping. The whispers swelled, filling the room. I began to play a simple melody, something I remembered from childhood. As the notes floated into the air, Clara's figure began to glow a warm light enveloping her. Thank you, she breathed, her expression one of relief. As I played, the whispers transformed into a harmonious chorus, a sweet melody that filled the room with warmth. I played on, losing myself in the music, the world around me fading away. When I finished, the attic was silent once more. Clara stood before me, a smile on her face. You've freed me, she said, her voice filled with gratitude. 
Before I could respond, her figure shimmered light, and with a gentle wave, she vanished, leaving behind a soft glow in the room. Suddenly, I heard a crash from downstairs, jolting me back to reality. I rushed down the stairs, my heart pounding. The front door swung open, and there stood John, panting and wide-eyed. What happened? He gasped, looking frantic. I, I think I helped her, I stammered, still processing what had just occurred. He looked past me, scanning the attic. Clara, is she? I nodded slowly. I played the piano. She said I freed her. John's face softened, tears brimming in his eyes. I never wanted her to suffer. She was my sister. I thought if I kept this house, I could keep her memory alive. We stood there in silence, the weight of the moment hanging between us. The house felt different now, lighter, as if the burdens of the past had been lifted. From that day on, the Miller house transformed. The whispers faded, replaced by a sense of peace. John and I finished the restorations together, honoring Clara's memory by making the house a beautiful home again. And every now and then, as I worked late into the night, I'd catch a soft humming in the air, a gentle reminder that Clara's spirit had finally found rest. Story the end. Story number eight. After losing my job, I found myself desperate for work. Bills were piling up and my savings were dwindling. One evening, while browsing Craigslist, I stumbled upon a peculiar ad. Job hunter needed. Help me find a job. Good pay. Must be discreet. Contact Sarah. At first, it seemed odd. Who needed someone to find them a job? But curiosity got the better of me. I was broke and could use the money, so I shot her an email. Within minutes, I received a response. Hello. Thank you for your interest. Can you meet me tomorrow at 3 p.m. at my apartment? Best Sarah. The next day, I arrived at the address, a nondescript building in a quiet neighborhood. I knocked, and a woman in her 30s with disheveled hair and dark circles under her eyes opened the door. You came. Thank you, she said, ushering me inside. The apartment was cluttered, filled with stacks of papers, clothes, and half-eaten takeout containers. It felt like a chaotic storm had hit the place. I really appreciate you coming, she continued, her voice shaky. I just need someone to help me find a job. I haven't had any luck on my own. As we sat down, she explained her situation. Sarah had been unemployed for months after losing her job at a marketing firm. She had sent out dozens of applications but received nothing in return. Her desperation was palpable, and I felt a twinge of sympathy. I can help you with your resume and job search, I offered, hoping to calm her nerves. Thank you. That would be great, she said, her expression brightening. Over the next few hours, we worked together, revising her resume and searching for job listings online. As we clicked through the ads, I couldn't shake the feeling that something was off. Sarah kept glancing nervously at the door, as if she were expecting someone to burst in. Is everything okay? I asked, trying to keep my tone light. Yeah, I just... I have a complicated situation, she replied, her voice barely above a whisper. I need a job to pay off some debts. It's not just money, it's my life at stake. I wanted to ask more, but she quickly changed the subject. Let's just focus on finding me a job, she insisted, her demeanor shifting back to urgency. As the sun began to set, Sarah grew increasingly agitated. I just know that if I don't find something soon, it'll be too late, she said, her eyes wide with fear. I'm sure something will come up, I reassured her, though I wasn't entirely convinced. Just as we were wrapping up for the night, Sarah's phone buzzed. She glanced at it and turned pale. Oh no! I need to take this, she said, quickly standing up and moving toward the other room. I could hear her voice rising, filled with distress. No, I can't do that. Please just give me more time. Her words were frantic, and I felt a chill creep down my spine. Something wasn't right. I stood up and crept toward the hallway, straining to listen. I could only make out snippets of her conversation. I can't pay you back now. I swear I'll find a job. Please, don't come here. My heart raced. Who was she talking to? Was she in some kind of trouble? I backed away, deciding it was best to leave. Just as I turned to head for the door, Sarah emerged from the other room, her face flushed. I'm really sorry about that, she said, her voice shaking. Just some family issues. I don't want to burden you with my problems. Look, I think I should go, I said, trying to sound nonchalant. I hope you find what you're looking for. Wait, she said, grabbing my arm. You can't leave yet. I need you to help me more. I have a list of jobs I want you to apply for on my behalf. Just a few more minutes. Feeling trapped, I reluctantly agreed to stay a little longer. She pulled out a crumpled list from a nearby drawer, her hands shaking. As she read off the jobs, I noticed her eyes darting nervously around the room as if she were still expecting someone. Suddenly, there was a loud bang at the door, making both of us jump. 
Sarah, open up, a deep voice called from the other side. Panic washed over her. Oh, God, it's him. You need to hide, she hissed, pushing me toward the closet. I hesitated, but the urgency in her voice compelled me to comply. I squeezed into the cramped space, my heart racing. The door swung open, and a man barged in, broad-shouldered and menacing, with a look of fury etched on his face. Where is she? I know you're in here, he shouted, scanning the room. I held my breath, trying to remain as still as possible. Please, just leave, Sarah begged, her voice trembling. I'm working on it, I promise. Working on it? You've had long enough? You think I'm just going to wait around while you flake on your debts? He growled, advancing toward her. I could feel the tension thickening in the air as Sarah stepped back, fear radiating from her. I just need a little more time, she pleaded. The man scoffed, and I heard him take a step closer. You've had enough time, Sarah. You know what happens if you don't pay up. I could see the panic in Sarah's eyes as she turned to glance at me, her expression pleading for help. My instincts kicked in. I couldn't just stand there. I had to do something. I slipped out of the closet, heart pounding, and shouted, Hey, what's going on here? Both Sarah and the man turned to me, surprise flashing across their faces. What the hell are you doing here? The man barked, taking a menacing step toward me. I was just helping her with job applications, I stammered, trying to sound confident. I didn't know. Helping her? He interrupted, glaring. She's in deep trouble. You shouldn't be here. Enough. I'll deal with you later, he snapped, turning back to Sarah. You better figure this out, or I'm coming for you. With that, he stormed out, slamming the door behind him. The weight of silence crashed over us. What was that about? I demanded, turning to Sarah, who was visibly shaken. I owe him money, she whispered, tears brimming in her eyes. He's been threatening me. I thought I could buy time, but I was wrong. I'm in over my head. Why didn't you tell me? I asked, my heart racing as I processed the situation. I didn't want to scare you away. I thought if I just found a job, everything would work out, she cried, her voice breaking. I felt a rush of sympathy for her, but also fear for my own safety. What are you going to do now? I don't know, she said, collapsing onto the couch. I can't keep living like this. I need to get out of here. I stood there, unsure of what to do. I had come to help her, but I never imagined it would lead to this. Suddenly, I had an idea. Maybe we can come up with a plan together. Let's figure out a way to deal with this. She looked up, her eyes wide with hope. You really want to help? Yeah, I do. I replied, trying to muster as much courage as I could. Let's work on a strategy to confront him or find a way to get the money you need. For the next hour, we brainstormed ideas, drafting a list of jobs to apply for and ways to make quick cash. As we worked, I couldn't shake the feeling that the danger wasn't over yet. Just as we finished discussing our plan, I heard footsteps outside the apartment. My heart raced as I exchanged a worried glance with Sarah. The door swung open again, and the same man stepped back inside eyes blazing with anger. What part of stay away didn't you understand? He snarled, his voice low and threatening. Before I could react, he lunged for me, grabbing me by the collar and slamming me against the wall. You're just making this worse for her. Wait, I was just trying to help. I gasped, struggling to free myself. Help? You think she needs help? She just needs to pay up? He shouted, his grip tightening. Sarah stepped forward, her voice shaky, but determined. No. I won't let you hurt him. This is my mess, not his. The man hesitated, looking between us. You're getting in over your head, Sarah. You think I won't come after you? You think you can just run away from your debts? I'm not running. I'm going to find a way to pay you back, she pleaded. The man's eyes darkened. You've had your chance. You're out of time. You better figure it out before I decide to teach you a lesson. With that, he released me and stormed out, slamming the door behind.